What happens when you die? That's a question we hear over and over, and this program is going to be dedicated to answering it. Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I have my two colleagues in the studio with me today, Nathan Jones, our Internet Evangelist, and Tim Moore, our Associate Evangelist, and my designated successor. Once again, we're going to be considering questions that people have submitted about Bible prophecy, and this week we're going to focus on questions about eternity, or to put it another way, questions about heaven and hell. Well, fellow, let's just jump right into this so that we can have as much time as possible. And the very first question that someone sent in is this. When a person dies, does he or she immediately go to heaven or hell, or do they spiritually sleep in the grave until the second coming of Jesus? My preachers teach us something called soul sleep. What about it? Hmm. Well, I know that there are some who uh, are misguided in terms of a soul sleep. We just hang out in some kind of limbo fashion. But the Apostle Paul was very clear, and he told us a couple different times. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, he says, Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. And he said also in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because he says again there in verse 30 or 23, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Paul said he knew that when he departed this body, he would be with Christ. Those are very good points, but. The person who believes in soul sleep would come back at you uh -huh. and say, okay, if there is no soul sleep, why is it the Bible refers to death as sleep? Well, that's because we're talking about the body here. What is six feet under is our physical human body, our earthly body. That naps on the ground. Can you imagine being a soul trapped with a decaying corpse under an air with the worms and the, the bugs and stuff? I mean, no wonder so many people are terrified of death. But the Bible says that we will be escorted by the angels up to Jesus Christ. So when the second you die and you believe in Jesus as your Savior, you will be before the Lord. Now, the body still waits on the earth. It waits for the rapture, the resurrection, if you're already dead. And the earthly body will be resurrected and put with our intermediate bodies, and they will then get our glorified bodies, and that's the bodies we will have so, for uh, eternity. It is uh, metaphorically true that the yes, uh, absolutely. death is sleep in the sense that the body goes into the ground, or the body is burned, or the body is lost in the ocean, or whatever. But when Jesus returns, a supernatural thing is going to happen. He's going to speak, and all those bodies are going to come back together. And uh, so they're going to wake. Awake. The Bible <laughs> uses sleep in the sense that the body is there, but the body is one day going to come up and arise, and there's going to be a resurrection, and it's going to wake up. So, Absolutely. yes. The and body sleeps, but not the soul. The soul goes to be with the Lord. Exactly. And there's a lot of people, especially Catholics, who write into the ministry and say, well, what about cremation? I mean, if you burn up the body, how can the Lord put all the... Well, the Lord works at the subatomic level. You're, don't worry about it. Your body will be resurrected. When the, the Bible talks about the sea will give up its dead, the earth will give... Wherever your body is, even if it's blown into the wind as atoms, the Lord will put it all back together again. Okay. Well, let's go to another question, and that is... This fellow says, I heard you guys say recently that believers in Jesus will live forever on a new earth. I thought our eternal home was going to be heaven. Oh, that's a very good question. Well, it is going to be heaven, but where, what defines heaven? Heaven is where God is. Amen. And so, wherever God is, that's where I want to be, and that to me is a heavenly place. It is heaven. And so, Scripture says that the Lord is going to return, as we've discussed many times, to reign on the earth. Heaven will come down and glory will fill the earth. And so, when that happens, Ezekiel even says, Jesus' name will then become Yahweh Shema, the Lord who is there. The Lord yes. is there on the earth. And so, heaven will be here. We will reign with Him on the earth. You know, having been raised in an amillennial church, when I first began to believe what the Bible really says about the end time, and started that transition to become premillennial in my view, 
uh, this was one of the things that was the biggest shock to me because I'd always been taught that we were going to be kind of like ghosts. We're going to be kind of like spirits uh, and we were going to float around on clouds and play harps and, and that heaven yeah. was an ethereal place. And, and of course a lot of that is due to Eastern religion concept. But when it said we're going to be in bodies and we're going to live on a new earth, I thought, man, nobody ever told me that. I always wondered how they could say that we'll be in ethereal bodies sitting on clouds playing harps. Wouldn't our hands go through the harps? <laughs> a that, as a, since a kid that imagery would bother me. Yeah. But the Bible talks about how it is a, in John 14 that Jesus has since He has left is in Heaven preparing a place for us, preparing our rooms. And we go to Revelation 20 and 21 and 22 and we read about what that place is and that's called the New Jerusalem. It's this super city that the Lord is building where He is going to take this place. Now it's 1,500 miles wide and long and high. So it could be a cube, it could be a pyramid, and it will come down to a new earth. Now it's been calculated that this city is so big that if it was on the current earth, the earth would wobble uncontrollably because of the size. So they'd estimated that the new earth might even be as large as Jupiter yeah. to handle a city that big. Yes. And that's the place, that's, that's heaven on earth. Well, this sure comes is. at the end of the millennial reign. God's going to take mm -hmm. all those who are believers and put them in that glorious new city, and then it's going to descend to the earth, and He's going to come and live in our midst. So, we're going to be in new bodies, in a new Jerusalem, on a new earth, living in the presence of our Creator and Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And what are glorious pictures provided for that? Even in Revelation 21 it says, The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of, the, of God has illuminated, and its lamp is the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And so that's what we can look forward to right here on earth. You know, uh, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, that was symbolic of the fact that the death of the Messiah, his blood, would make it possible for the grace of God to cover the law of God, which was in that uh, ark. But he also stepped back and he sprinkled the blood on the ground. And most people overlook that. And that was symbolic of the fact that the Messiah's death would also result in the redemption of the physical universe. Yes. God intends to redeem this universe and put it back to its perfected state mm -hmm. as He originally corrected. So, yes, there's going to be a new earth, but it's going to be a perfected earth yes. and beautiful beyond anything we can imagine. Well, you'd have to think too, how could we be ghosts if we're eating from the tree of life? Ghosts don't need to eat from the tree That's of life. True. It talks about we're coming in and out of gates. Well, why would we need to come in and out of gates if we didn't have bodies? We know that our bodies will be tangible, they'll be recognizable, they'll be physical. We'll be wearing clothes. Ghosts yeah. don't need to wear clothes, but we'll be wearing robes. Jesus so. and His glorified body ate with the disciples. Yes. And yes. So, He enjoyed the Oh yes, the that's bounty. one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm most excited <laughs> about. I believe in my glorified body, I'll be able to eat all I want yes. without having to gain a pound. There there you go. Not even an ounce. Exactly. Okay. All right. Another question. I heard you fellas say one time that Christians are going to be judged of their works when they stand before the judgment seat of Jesus. That would be right after the rapture. I thought we were saved by grace through faith and not by works. Explain. Uh, good question. Nathan, you want to start with this one? Well, certainly. Well, this is called the judgment of the just. You can find this in 2 Corinthians 5.10. So, yes, every person that's ever been created will stand before God and be judged. But this is the big difference. We will be judged for our works. But since we accepted the only work that matters, Jesus' saving work on the cross, our sins are forgiven. It's not a judgment of salvation whatsoever. No. It's a judgment of the good works that we allowed the Holy Spirit to do through us while on the, we're in this earth. Now, the Bible says so we will be rewards. Yeah. There'll be rewards. We'll be judged for the quality, the quantity, and the motivations behind them. Yes. And the Bible it kind of compares it to like fire burning up the chaff. If we did something selfishly or, or we got all the attention we needed, that that was our reward at that time. Some are going to be saved with their tail feathers smoking. Right. But we <laughs> all get eternal rewards for the good that the Lord has done through us. And that comes in a variety of ways. Uh, I think the, there's tangible ones. And I, I could go through the crowns yeah, and the robes and we get new names. I won't be called Nathan anymore and you won't be Tim. We'll have new names. But it's the fact that Jesus Christ has saved us and we get to dwell with our Creator. And the Bible even says that we are honored before the Father. What? We honored before the Father? I mean, that's just amazing. Those are the gifts that I'm looking for. Well, I actually know uh, that when we stand before the Father, what will be looked at will be all of our works. But when the Father says, is there anyone willing to testify and affirm this person's sinlessness, their righteousness, their, their merit to enter the Kingdom of Heaven, Jesus Christ will say, I am. 
Yep. Yes. And that is His eternal name, but it also testifies that He has covered all of our, our sinfulness. Yeah. And so, the only thing that remains after that chaff is burned away is our good deeds. And so, they are judged, but even then Christ gets the credit for our yeah. good deeds, which is why the crowns that we are given, if you will, yeah. we cast before His throne, giving Him mm -hmm. glory and honor for even the good deeds we're able to accomplish. So, we don't work to be saved, but we, uh, are, uh, we are saved for good works. For good and, works, and most we're Definitely. supposed to be doing those. And what people need to understand, particularly believers who are watching, is that when you're born again you're given at least one supernatural gift of God and may be given others along the way. And God is going to, Jesus is going to judge us on how we use those spiritual gifts to advance His Kingdom. So, if you have the gift of teaching, did you ever use it to exactly. advance His Kingdom? Well, again, Paul says, Therefore, in Christ Jesus I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. For I will not presume to speak of anything except Christ, who has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by the word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and roundabout, as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Even Paul's calling, even his ministry, he credits Jesus Christ, and it will be given back to him in glory and honor. Okay, fellas, we've got about a minute and 20 seconds in this segment for you to answer this question. Will people be given a second chance after death to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior? No. No, clearly not. Because no ands, ifs, or buts. No ands, ifs, or buts. No stuttering. No stuttering. That's a short answer. <laughs> Hebrews 9 27 says that it is given to man once to die and then to be judged. And so there is no second chance after this life. In this life, there's a second, a third, a fourth, fifth. Yes. If you're watching today, yeah. you have a chance right now. Right. But you're not promised another moment. There's so many people thinking they're going to get a second chance. Uh, this is but that you know, chance. The thing that's interesting about that, even if they were given a second chance, they'd probably say no. Because they've rebelled against God all this life. They don't want to subject themselves to anyone. And they would probably say no then. And it brings up the concept of purgatory too. The Catholic teaching came hundreds of years after the Bible was completed. That we suffer for our sins for a period of time. But the blood of Jesus purifies us from our sins. That's, uh, that's 1 John 1, 7. one verse in, in uh, uh, one of the apocryphal uh, right. scriptures. Right. So, there's no afterlife where you spend time you, burning off you your sins. When you say you've got to be, be cleansed of sin after this life, then you're blaspheming the cross of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because it's, it's all we need. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our discussion of what the Bible says about eternity, both heaven and hell. Okay, Dave, so what's your next question? <laughs> well, the next question is a very important one because many religions of the world teach reincarnation. Mm. Uh, many people involved in the New Age movement uh, talk about that. Is there such a thing as reincarnation? I like this particular song sung by Willie Nelson. You're a huge Willie Nelson yes. fan. He sings, I fly a starship across the universe divide, and when I reach the other side, I'll find a place to rest my spirit if I can. Perhaps I may become a highwayman again. Or I may simply be a single drop of rain, but I will remain, and I'll be back again and, <laughs> and again, again and again and again. But doesn't Hebrews 9.27 say, just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, to die once. Reincarnation is Eastern mysticism. There's no truth to it. It's a false religion. It's amazing how it's in, invaded Christianity in this country, though. It so many, has. Yeah. Admittedly, even when Jesus Himself said that we must be born again, it was a confusing phrase and a confusing topic or concept because Nicodemus said, well, how can that be? How can a man enter his mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus went on to explain in the following portion of John chapter 3 that this would be a spiritual rebirth, not a physical rebirth. And that's very important. He will redeem our bodies and re return us to a glorified body when we are brought back together at the reincarnate, or excuse me, at the uh, resurrection. But our born again nature is a spiritual rebirth yes. that happens when I'm we glad accept you Him. I mentioned that because uh, I know from reading literature by people who believe in reincarnation, even Christians, or supposed Christians, they always quote that by Jesus. Well, Jesus said you've got to be born again, so that means reincarnation. But they don't go on to read the next explanation yes. that He provides. It is a spiritual rebirth, yes. not a physical rebirth. Yes. Plus, if karma is meant to burn off bad energy, yes. well, what bad energy are we talking about? We, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Our sins are forgiven. There's no bad energy. There's no sin following yes, us. Yes, that undermines the very promise well, of the cross of Christ. Reincarnation is simply a rejection Absolutely. of Jesus Christ and His uh, sacrifice on yes, the cross. Yes, it is. It's 
know yeah. I'm going to be purified and become one with God uh, through a constant process of rebirth and getting better and better and better unless I do something bad, which case I come back as a rat. And who would want to do that? Who'd want to, an endless coming back and again and again, <laughs> never breaking that wheel? Okay, no. well let's go to the next one. Romans mm-hmm. eleven twenty six says, all Israel will be saved. Does that mean that every Jew who has ever lived is going to go to heaven? No. Sadly, no. You keep saying that word. I no. know. <laughs> I'm the, the no You're man. You're not very today. open-minded. <laughs> You know, Scripture says that a remnant of the Jews will be saved. And we know that during the tribulation period, tragically, many Jews will die. There will be a remnant who will then look upon Him whom they have pierced. And when they come to the end of themselves, just as a Gentile who must come to the end of themselves and come to recognize that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, the life, and that they can embrace Him for their salvation. The same thing with the Jews. A remnant will be saved, but not every Jew that has ever lived, tragically. Well, uh, actually, uh, the context of that statement, that statement is in Romans 11 and uh, in verse 26. But the context is Romans 9 through 11, all about the Jewish people. And in Romans 9, verse 27, he quotes Isaiah. And he says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. So he's talking there what you said. The remnant of the Jews who are alive at the end of the tribulation who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And at the end of the tribulation, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 says, But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong, and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. It is that remnant yeah. mm-hmm. that will be preserved and will be saved. That's one of the major purposes of the tribulation is to bring a remnant of the Jewish people to the end of themselves yes. where they will look upon Him whom they pierced and weep and will and mourn, repent and receive Him as their Messiah. By the end of the tribulation, two-thirds of the Jewish people, that would be nine million yeah. people yeah. in today's numbers are that's dead. Right. But the remnant that sees Jesus, they cry because they realize that Jesus is the Messiah they've been waiting for. And then you always say it, they say it better than I do. Baruch haba Hashem Adonai. <laughs> Blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what they say when he returns. I think there's an application here even yeah. for Gentile believers today who sometimes angst over the condition of their children. Yeah. And they send them a stipend to keep them strung along in their depravity. And I say, don't do that. Yeah. Allow the Lord to deal with them. Force them under the Lord's hand to come to the end of themselves and find Jesus exactly Christ as their Savior. In the story of the prodigal son. Exactly. The father right. allowed the son to take his way. Pray for them, encourage them, but don't string them along in depravity. In other words, allow them to come to the end of themselves right. so right. that they come to the, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Most common question, perhaps asked more than any other question will we know each other in heaven? <laughs> Well, I certainly think so. Uh, We're going to know the Lord, and He's going to know us. We will then see and know just as we are fully known. And so, I think the relationships that have been such an important part of our lives here on this earth will continue, but they will be perfected even in that regard. Look, if I'm David here on earth, and I'm not David in eternity, David wasn't saved. Somebody else was. <laughs> Come on. Well, we yeah, we're going to have new names, but we're going to be able to recognize each other. Oh, yeah. so. In 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 50, it says, The body that is sown is perishable, is raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. And here's the clincher here So shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Who is the man from heaven? It's Jesus Christ. We could look at his resurrected body. He ate. Thomas could put his fingers in his side. He could touch the holes. They recognized Jesus. But Jesus could do other things that He couldn't do in His earthly body. He would just show up in rooms and scare the living daylights out of the apostles. He ascended up to heaven. Next moment in Galilee. Right. If the New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles up, I don't think we're taking elevators. We will just (laughs) fly up there or just move to there. Yeah, it has a new dimension to it, but it certainly is a wreck. Now, when Jesus was first resurrected, uh, they didn't res- uh, recognize him, and there was a good reason. He obscured himself. I mean, come on. Yeah. If he dies today and tomorrow he comes to my door and <laughs> knocks on the door, I say, yeah. Man, I used to know a guy who looked just like yeah. you. Well, <laughs> I, I, yes, that and our human nature right now. I've walked into a room not expecting to see a certain person and just looked right past them until all of a sudden it dawned on me, <laughs> yes. What are you doing here? Last, person, you expect to last see. person I expected to see, exactly. Okay, we come to one of your favorite questions. Are there going to be animals in heaven? 
Are there going to be animals? You mean yeah, animals two part or animal. pets? No, two-part question. Number okay. one, are there going to be animals? And number two, will there be our pets? Well, we know that we follow Jesus Christ on white horses. Yeah. Now, it has debated whether these horses could be angels, but it seems like they're horses. It says they're yeah. horses. It doesn't say they're angels. So, we know there's there's animals. We know there are a lot of animals in heaven now. Yes. Those strange creatures before the uh, throne are yeah. kind of like animals. Well, I guess the seraphim are animal-like in and appearance. And we go back to our previous conversation, heaven is going to be on the earth, which is restored to perfection. So, there are Good animals point. on the earth. I yes. mean, this is a, a material world, even as it is perfected in spiritual glory. So, yeah, animals will be there. And I would add that we're not just talking about the animals today, but we could be talking about whole different species that have been wiped out, like dinosaurs oh, and, yeah. and oh, yeah. mammoths and things. God, being the Creator, could create all new species that we've never <laughs> encountered before. Sure. And we could go, there won't be oceans, but there'll be seas, and we could go down into the seas and maybe see, see fish life that have yet to be encountered. There is... A zoologist's dream, I think, in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> what about pets? Uh, see, now this is, I'm going to let Tim answer that one. Okay. <laughs> I think the, the, the Bible is silent about pets. Yes. And so yeah. I do not uh, endeavor to comment. I know pets are very significant in the lives of people who are believers. They have a relationship with an animal that they dearly love. And I have already said, I think the relationships will continue. Well, so I think God has a lot of surprises in store oh, for certainly. us about heaven. Oh, yes. And, uh, I, as a person who's had pets that I love dearly and still have their collars in my desk and their pictures on my desk, I just hope and pray that one of the surprises God will have for us is I'll have uh, Miss Lizzie uh, <laughs> Back again, to yeah. be able to love, own, and pet Back in heaven. But, you know, as you say, we don't know for sure. But we can be sure, and we can definitely be sure of this, that animals will not be raptured to heaven. We get no, this question a no, lot. You know, no. we'll, the rapture is I only meant for that question, really? Yeah, well, they're worried about their pets being left behind. <laughs> How, who's going to take care of their pets after they're gone? Pets will not be raptured to heaven. Okay, another question. Is hell for real? My pastor says it's a metaphor for the suffering that we experience in this life. In fact, I would say that's the position taken by most of the mainline denominations today. All right, I'm going to shock you guys. Come on, I say in a one word, yes. Hell is for real. <laughs> hey, yes. We finally, finally got a yes. Get a yes. <laughs> exactly right. I, I will quote C.S. Lewis who said this about hell. There is no doctrine which I, C.S. Lewis, would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But it, the concept of hell, has the full support of Scripture and specifically of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom, and it has the support of reason. And indeed, Jesus Christ spoke more about hell than He did about heaven. And so, He was warning people to flee from the wrath to come to avoid hell, and He gave very clear descriptions about hell and spoke about it often. Well, if we're going to be held responsible for the decisions that we make in this life, there has to be a hell. Yes. And we have to differentiate, too, between Hades and hell. I think yes. a lot of people are yes. confused yeah. that Hades or Sheol or Torments is where the unredeemed go when they die, awaiting to be resurrected at the end to of this the millennial day. kingdom. To the there is nobody in hell there. right now. And we know hell was created for Satan and the demons, yes. but when mankind fell, we fell under the same. So, Hades and the unredeemed will be then, after the great white throne judgment, cast into the lake of fire or hell. And that's so it's actually a two-part thing that most people... but. The descriptions of the two are very similar. Heat, but darkness, gnashing of teeth, loneliness, crying and despair. All these things describe both of those. Yes, and, and this brings us back to something we discussed in the first section about purgatory. When we talk about the fact that people who are lost go to a place called Hades, we're not talking about purgatory. No, no, no. No, this, this is a holding place for the spirits of those who have rejected the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And it, I think the, the term of torments, that's what it calls it, a, a compartment in Hades called torments, pretty well indicates what's going on there. And, uh, but but the, those of us who are believers, we don't go there. We no. go directly to Heaven. We don't, we don't need to be purged. Jesus told about Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man was in a place of tormenting pain and suffering in that torment section of Hades. Some people who argue that the church must go through the tribulation say, well, the church must be purified. Well, that makes the tribulation a... a, a Protestant purgatory. A, a, yes. a kind of purgatory. We yeah. don't need to be purified. We've been purified by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And that's all that is needed. Praise God. Amen. Praise okay. the Lord.
Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy and our discussion of what the Bible says about eternity, both heaven and hell. Okay, Dave, we have time for one more question. Okay, Lay it on us. Why is Christianity so intolerant as to claim that one must be a Christian in order to go to heaven? What about Jews and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists? Well, I wouldn't call Christianity intolerant, but I would call Christianity crystal clear about the means of salvation. And that's because Jesus Himself was crystal clear. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Me. How could that be any clearer? That is crystal clear. And Paul reiterates that over and over again. He says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And again in 1 Timothy 2 5, there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. I would say, referring to Jews and Buddhists and Hindus, people who have been raised in other religions are welcome. To come to Jesus Christ. A lot of Jews consider themselves cultural Jews or by heritage. Oh, yeah. So there are Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. A person Muslim can come, believers Muslim believers, they have abandoned faith in Allah or in Muhammad, but they now confess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. So whatever their heritage, Christianity is not intolerant. It welcomes them to come to the one means of salvation, the way, truth, and life, Jesus Christ. Anything to add to that? It's all inclusive to all people. It doesn't matter what race, creed, color, or gender. The Lord will accept you all if you accept His Son. Exactly. Well, folks, that's our program for today. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and the Lord willing, I hope you'll be back with us again next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. If you found this program interesting, we would suggest you order a copy of our newest video album, Questions and Answers About Bible Prophecy. The album contains two DVD discs that feature seven television programs in which Dr. David Reagan, Colonel Tim Moore, and our internet evangelist, Nathan Jones, answer questions sent into the ministry by our television audience. The first two programs concern the validity of the Bible and Bible prophecy in general. These are followed by five programs that respond to specific Bible prophecy questions regarding the signs of the times, the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium, and eternity. Each of the programs run about 25 minutes in length and each program could be used as a starter for a group discussion of the topic. The total running time of all the programs is approximately 175 minutes. The album can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Just call our ministry at the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time or place your order through our website at lamblion.com. This album contains answers to the most frequently asked questions about Bible prophecy. Again, the album can be yours for a gift of $20 or more, including the cost of shipping. Just call our ministry Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time and ask for item number D83 or Place your order through our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.